Let's say that you have a group study session coming up and everyone's bringing snacks to make the hard work a little more fun. You've decided to bring a batch of blueberry muffins from your favorite recipe. 10 people are coming to the study session and you want there to be two muffins per person, but your recipe only makes a batch of 10. You need to double it to end up with the right amount of muffins at the end. But you can't just add more flour or butter or eggs at random. That's because the proportions of ingredients matter. The ratio of eggs to flour to sugar is what makes the difference between a light fluffy muffin and a dense chewy lump. In chemistry, we treat changes to the amounts we need in a reaction the same way we would in a recipe. And this method is called stoichiometry. We'll cover this subject as well as bake some muffins in today's episode. Hi, I'm Will Komar and welcome back to Study Hall Chemistry presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. Let's dive in. Stoichiometry originated in the 18th century when German chemist Jeremiah Benjamin Richter coined the term and described it as a relationship of chemical measurements obeying the laws of mathematical proportions. These days, we can describe stoichiometry as a mathematical relationship between constituents or parts in a reaction. We use it to find out how much of one substance we have in relation to the other reactants and products. Stoichiometry relies on ratios or fractions of moles of each substance to find any unknowns. Though Richter's writing was described as obscure and clumsy, stoichiometry was, and forever will be, a huge deal in chemistry. We've been able to unlock a ton of information on complicated compounds because we can use math and moles to figure out their weights and structures. Stoichiometry might sound intimidating based on the spelling alone, but it can quickly become more manageable with some practice and examples. So let's get into the basics with a little help from test two. Let's think of that blueberry muffin recipe as a chemical reaction. It's like a synthesis reaction. Combine the ingredients, add heat, and you get 10 muffins as the product. We could write this reaction out using our amounts of ingredients as the coefficients. Technically, those coefficients would be moles instead of cups or teaspoons, but we'll generalize here to get the idea across. Like I mentioned before, if we want to double the recipe to make 20 muffins for the study session, we need to keep the ratios between the ingredients the same so the muffins aren't too dry or too buttery. To make things easier, we can just multiply our reaction by two on both sides. But if we wanted eight muffins or 15 or 50, how many eggs or sticks of butter would we need? That's when we can use ratios to help us out. It takes two eggs to make 10 muffins, or a ratio of two to 10. So if we want to end up with 15 muffins, we need to plug in 15 for muffins and solve for eggs. We could arrange it like a dimensional analysis problem, canceling units to convert to what we need. So 15 muffins times our ratio, two eggs over 10 muffins. Then we can cancel out muffins to get our answer of three eggs. What about if we had five sticks of butter? Again, it's all about maintaining the ingredient ratio from the original reaction, one stick of butter to 10 muffins. So we can multiply five sticks by 10 muffins over one stick. Our sticks of butter cancel out and we find out we can make 50 muffins. Yum. Whether we're making blueberry muffins or bromine pentafluoride, Preserving the ratios between measurements in a reaction is important. We can't increase or decrease only one ingredient. If something changes, everything needs to. Of course, as with any kind of cooking or chemistry, sometimes things don't go according to plan. Let's say that while you're setting up to bake 20 muffins, your cat Stella jumps on the counter, knocks two of your four eggs to the ground. Eggs would then become our limiting reactant the ingredient that determines how much product can be formed. In other words, this is the reactant that will get used up first in the reaction. And once it's gone, we can't make any more muffins. All our other ingredients here would then be excess reactants. This means we have more of these than necessary in order to complete a full reaction with the limiting reactant. To put this another way, we'll have a lot of leftover ingredients we can't use because there aren't enough eggs. So let's pretend that we can grab two replacement eggs from the fridge and now we have enough for a real double batch of muffins again. We sneak the batter into the oven before Stella can interfere. But as the baked muffins are cooling, Stella gets revenge by snatching one for herself. We couldn't have predicted that she'd misbehave, but it still changed our final product. Likewise, in chemistry, factors outside our control can influence how much of a product is actually generated in a reaction. The amount we expect to generate, or the theoretical yield, isn't always what we get. The amount that's really produced is called the actual yield. In this case, our theoretical yield of muffins is 20. Our actual yield, if Stella steals one, would then be 19. Okay, 
To get away from muffin talk before it makes us all hungry, let's try an actual stoichiometry example. Just like the one with mole problems we've done already, there's a set of steps we can follow in every case. So let's take the double displacement reaction between lead 4 sulfate and lithium nitrate to form lead 2 nitrate and lithium sulfate. Lead nitrate used to be a popular substance with alchemists. They even called it plum dulcis because it apparently had a sweet flavor. But I'll stick with eating baked goods and, and not heavy metals. Anyway, we want to find out how many grams of lithium nitrate we need to produce 251 grams of lithium sulfate. Our first step is, as usual, to list out our givens. We know we have to end up with 251 grams of lithium sulfate. We also know the molar mass of lithium sulfate from the periodic table at 110 grams per mole. Second, we need to take our grams of lithium sulfate and convert them to moles using the compound's molar mass, just like we've done with mole to mass problems in previous episodes. So we'd write out 251 grams of lithium sulfate times the molar mass of lithium sulfate. We need to flip the fraction so that we've got the moles on top, since that's the units we need to convert to. Our grants will cancel out when we multiply our terms. Step three is our most important one. It's where we convert from moles of our given substance to moles of the substance we're trying to find, using something called the mole ratio. It represents the coefficients in a balanced chemical reaction and works as a conversion factor. We can look at any of the compounds in a reaction and use a mole ratio to find out how much there is in terms of another. It just depends on what we have and what we're asked to find. In our example, the mole ratio would be a ratio between the number of moles of given lithium sulfate and the number of moles of lithium nitrate. To find the ratio, we need to look at our balanced chemical reaction. This would be a great time to double check that a reaction is, in fact, balanced. Otherwise, our calculations will turn out wonky. In our reaction, we have two moles of lithium sulfate for every four moles of lithium nitrate, and that's our mole ratio. As usual, in mole calculations, we'd write this into our equation so that the moles of the substance we have are in the denominator, and the moles of the substance we want to find are in the numerator. That way, our moles of lithium sulfate will cancel, leaving us with moles of lithium nitrate. Step four is to then convert from moles to the units we need, which will be grams of lithium nitrate. To do this, we need the molar mass of lithium nitrate, which we can get from the periodic table. Much like we did in step two, we can arrange our molar mass so that we have our desired units of grams in the numerator and the moles in the denominator so they'll cancel out. You can tackle the math in each of these steps one at a time, or wait to write it all out in one equation like we've done here. When we multiply across and cancel our units, we end up with 314.89091 grams of lithium nitrate. Our last step is to check that these are the units we want and represent the final answer in correct sig figs, which in this case would be three. Our final answer is that it would take 315 grams of lithium nitrate to produce 251 grams of lithium sulfate in this reaction. The steps we just went through to find an answer in grams can also work for situations where we need to find out how many moles of a substance are needed or produced in a reaction. The process is the same, we just have a slightly different setup for the calculation. Maybe we want to use a cast iron muffin tin when baking, but when we pull it out, we find it's begun to form iron three oxide or rust. Using the reaction between iron and oxygen to produce iron three oxide, let's say the pan started with 0.275 moles of iron, and we need to know how many moles of iron three oxide are produced. We have our givens for step one, and step two would be to convert to moles, but we can actually skip that this time since we're already in moles. We can go straight to step three, multiplying 0.275 moles of iron by our mole ratio. Looking at the coefficients in this reaction, we have a ratio of four moles of iron for every two moles of iron three oxide. In our calculation, we'll put the four moles of iron in the denominator so iron will cancel and we'll get an answer in moles of iron three oxide. We can skip step four, converting from moles to our desired units because again, we're already in moles. Very convenient. And when we multiply across our conversion, our result is 0.1375 moles of iron three oxide. The last thing we need to do is round to the proper sig figs, so we end up with 0.138 moles as our final answer. Determining how much of a substance we need to complete a reaction and knowing how much of something we'll produce can be helpful in many different situations. Stoichiometry allows us to plan experiments with accuracy and ensure we have enough of a chemical to get the amount of product needed, like we'd adjust a recipe to the number of muffins we want to have. Next time, we'll talk more about real-life applications of stoichiometry and where it's used. 
We'll also do some more complicated problems and go into more detail on theoretical and actual yields. Thanks for watching Study Hall Chemistry, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us here in Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about ASU and the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See y'all next time.